Welcome to Discovering. It's ice fishing season here in the UP, and one of the factors we tend to overlook is safety. I connected up with the Delta County Search and Rescue Team to find out about some of the things we can do to be safer on the ice, and what they have to do when we don't. We're here with Discovering, telling you about how to stay safe on the ice and what to do if you, know, you happen to fall through the ice. And Kristen shows us a bit of the UP winter wonderland. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. The Upper Peninsula is home to and surrounded by some pretty great lakes. They provide us with year-round recreation of all sorts. During the cold winter months, these frozen lakes can make for some pretty good ice fishing. But if we're not careful, these same lakes can prove to be deadly. I met with the Delta County Search and Rescue Team to find out what their role is when things go bad. We have a, a 1,170 square miles of Delta County that we cover. Inside that 1,170, there's 221 uh, miles of lakeshore. Uh, so we stay pretty busy throughout the year. We cover any kind of swift water, land search, rope rescue, and obviously ice rescue that the community needs. So we'll cover any bodies of water um, in Delta County. Uh, the Sheriff's Department does have a separate Marine Patrol division that, uh, that will go out into the parts of, the, of Green Bay, but uh, we cover the smaller in the lakes, the near shore, Big Bay, sm uh, Little Bay, and any of the rivers. As far as the counties surrounding us, uh, we do provide mutual aid to any of those counties if, if they do need us. Um, our dive team is one that specifically is frequently called for, uh, for mutual aid for the surrounding counties because they don't all have dive teams. Uh, but search and rescue will do mutual aid for any of the surrounding counties as well. We have separate little teams inside of our team. So we have a, you know, we have a team that's trained in rope rescue. We have a team that's trained in swift water, ice rescue, and then there's a lot of people on our team that's cross-trained. Cross we have 20 members on our team. We're an all-volunteer team. We actually fall under the preview of the Sheriff's Department, but we're part of their Special Operations Division. So we fall on the same line as the dive team and the snowmobile crews and this and that. We are not law enforcement. We are all volunteer. Everybody's outfitted with all this gear, so we do have quite a budget as far as our rescue gear goes. When you're using something for a, a rescue type scenario, you have to have top of the line gear. And we want the community to know that, you know, we have this and we appreciate their, their help in purchasing it. As far as our swift water gear, we've got a swift water PFD and a helmet. The uh, PFD is, is different, it's a specific PFD, um, different than a regular uh, consumer PFD. So it's got a lot of additional straps and features um, and we'll, we're able to tether the rescuer to a anchor either on, on land or to another person who's, who's holding the rope so that you're not out there just free floating. Rope rescue gear, we've got our harness, more than our typical recreational climbing harness. Uh, this harness is, has steel buckles um, and a, a much larger belt and straps. And then when we actually do our, our rescue, we will use all steel hardware, um, which we use our anchor strap and our steel carabiners and pulleys, um, and then our ascender descender of device. We can raise and lower the victim who's in a, a basket with this device. We use a very thick climbing rope, a rescue rope. We've also got a, um, 
a rescue helmet with a visor, of course for protection from, from stuff falling and, and landing on, on top of you. Our rescue basket is a flexible basket that we can do a horizontal or vertical raise with. But, uh, when we need to go in and extricate somebody from the, from the woods, um, if we've got a narrow path, something where we can't get down it with a side-by-side -side or four-wheeler, we've got uh, what's called a snow dog here. And this is a small tracked vehicle that you can steer from back from the sled or we've also got a cart for it in the summer. You'll stand in it or sit in it like this and, and, and drive into those smaller areas where the trail may not be as wide. Um, we can then put the victim on another sled behind there and, and pull them out. We'll also use this on the ice. This is called a nebulous and it, it's a air pack essentially that if, if you were to get into a situation where, the, where it was about to sink, you could pull the, orange, or the yellow handle here and, and the nebulous would inflate and, and we could retrieve it that way. So let's talk about ice fishing a little bit. Let's start out with the number one rule for ice. There is no safe ice. Our bay here, what you need to remember is there's always a current on that bay and it's always working at eroding the underside of the ice. So anytime you're on the bay, there are a few things that you should bring with you. Uh, number one, ice picks. They do you absolutely no good in, in your fishing pail or, or whatever, so be wearing them. Number two, ice chisel. You should check the ice if you're going on ice that you haven't been on before. Uh, you should always go with another person. Never go alone. Watch for pressure cracks, things. If you, if, if you see something you don't like, don't go over it. Probably one of the most important things and one of the coolest things, because I'm an ice fisherman, that's come out in the last few years is, is the flotation suits. Your flotation's built right in to your ice fishing suit. Um, if you don't have that flotation, you should either wear a personal flotation vest or a blow up vest, but definitely make sure you have some kind of a flotation. You want to self rescue if possible. The first thing you want to do is get to the edge of the ice. You want to kick your feet as hard as you can and try to pull yourself arm over arm out. Obviously the direction you want to come out of the ice is the same way that you walked into it because you know the ice was safe until you fell through. So now we're gonna do self-rescue with ice picks, which you should always have on you. And you'll see everybody going in backwards because even with an ice rescue suit on, when your face hits the water, you still get that breather reflex because it's so cold. And you're gonna see how much easier it is to get out. You still wanna kick your feet, but use those picks to dig in and then you want to roll away from the hole, obviously. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Without an ice rescue suit on, this has got about two shots at it before it's not going to work for you. We use the ice rescue suits. They are a suit that will provide buoyancy and also thermal protection for the rescuers. If you have ever seen any of the uh, um, fishing shows from Alaska, Deadliest Catch, for example, these are the same suits that, the, that they would use for their survival suits. And just to give you a little bit more information about the ice rescue suit, uh, as I mentioned before, it does provide flotation and thermal protection. But to give you an idea about the flotation that it provides for, for our rescuers and for the victims both, the typical personal flotation device, or PFD, provides typically 15 pounds of flotation, but our ice rescue suits provide 35 pounds of flotation uh, what that translates to, if you think about a human body, a human body weighs about 10 pounds when it's suspended in water. So we've got 35 pounds of flotation with this ice rescue suit, so it's actually very difficult. In fact, one of the difficulties we have when we're training our rescuers is, is how to manage that 35 pounds of flotation that they have. It's very difficult sometimes for them to manage the flotation that it provides for them when they're in the water. And our rescue noodle, again, that provides 15 pounds of flotation. So there's plenty of flotation for the rescuer when they're actually in the water and they're performing a rescue. So there's really little danger of them sinking. And the thermal protection that it provides, it provides several hours of thermal protection when they're in that cold water. So those ice rescue suits are really a great, great tool for us to have when we're performing an ice rescue. We also use reaching devices called a rescue noodle, which is a, a uh, product that was created specifically for ice rescue from a, a local Wisconsin company. It's 
been adopted by most search and rescue, ice rescue agencies. And then also a anchor bag, which we'll anchor ourselves to good ice and then uh, tether ourselves to that good ice by use of an ice screw that will sink down into the, into the ice. So, you know, you need to make sure that you carry those ice picks with you and they're accessible. Don't over exhaust yourself. Stay calm, wait for us. Call, yell for people around you. Do everything you can to get attention. So now we're gonna show one rescuer rescuing a victim in the water and you're gonna watch as, as he goes up there, the first thing he's gonna do is grab hold of her. And the first rule we have is, is once you get a hold of her, you never let go. So that's a conscious victim in the water because they can help you. And obviously an unconscious victim can't help you. So you actually have to get in the water and help them out of the water onto the ice. Obviously you've got a certain amount of time when you fall through the ice to, to do something and you want to try to get out of the water uh, if you can, but uh, you don't want to wear yourself out to the point where you can't keep yourself above water. And if you happen to fall through and somebody's there, dial 911. This is what we're here for. Here's Doc Bigsby with some important information for not only ice fishermen, but anyone who ventures out onto the ice. Information that could someday save your life or the life of a friend. I want to talk a little bit about, about cold water. Um, cold water is actually defined as is any water that's below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we, that's an important thing to remember, but we want to talk about really cold water. So really cold water is water that's below 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you fall into water that's really cold, that is below 41 degrees Fahrenheit, we have some reflexes that kick in. One of the most important ones is described by an exercise physiologist, uh, Dr. Gordon Giesbeck, who's from the University of Manitoba. He's come up with a, with a concept that's called 1101. And that uh, is a concept that when you fall into cold water, you have about one minute to get your breathing under control. What happens when you fall into cold water, you gasp and you start to hyperventilate. If you don't get your breathing under control and uh, control that gasp reflex and the hyperventilation, you're at danger of aspirating that water. If that happens, you can drown immediately in that, in that one to two minute period. If you can control that, you can be safe. But then you've got about 10 minutes in which you can do something to try to rescue yourself. And of course, the most important thing is to try to get yourself out of the, out of the water and get out onto the ice shelf. After about 10 minutes, you're, you lose control of your muscles and then you have what's known as swim failure and then you won't be able to self-rescue and then you're stuck in the water. At that point, then you start to lose body heat. You've got approximately an hour in water that temperature before you start to become hypothermic. And then after that hour period, you then become unconscious and then will drown because of hypothermia. So that's the one ten one concept. The other thing that's important uh, for people to recognize is that when we rescue someone from the water, it's very important for us to keep that patient horizontal when we remove them from the water. We don't want to let the patient stand up or walk after we get them out of the cold water. There's a thing known as circumrescue collapse. A victim uh, that's been in the cold water, even for a short period of time, can either faint or even suffer cardiac arrest if they're allowed to walk or even just simply stand after they've been submerged in cold water. So we always handle them very gently and try to evacuate them off the ice in a horizontal position. So as far as ice rescue in Delta County, um, when someone is in trouble on the ice, there are several different departments that will respond. We have our ice rescue team, which is Delta County Search and Rescue, also Gladstone Public Safety, uh, Ensign Fire Department, and Masonville EMS uh, that will respond to those type of calls. So we have a lot of people from a lot of parts of the county um, that, are, that volunteer to, to perform these ice rescues. Um, it's a large group, but we'd like to have as many people as are available 
to respond to those type of ice rescue calls. This is our RDC, or Rapid Deployment Craft, also affectionately known as a banana boat. Uh, it's a great rescue tool. We inflate it with, a, with an air tank, uh, just what firefighters use to, uh, on their, on their uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. Inflates uh, in a matter of less than 30 seconds. Uh, has three separate air chambers. It has over 3,000 pounds of flotation. And we can carry it uh, manually, lift it, and walk it out to the, to the victim. We have a motor mount. We can also paddle it out to the victim. Um, and we can use it uh, to rescue the victim through one of the wells, pull them up onto the deck, and evacuate them off of the ice. We can also use it uh, in the summertime for open water rescues. We can use it in river rescues, lake rescues, as well as the ice rescue. This piece of equipment here, it's called an RDC. It has a lot of different uses. We can actually uh, use this in open water scenarios. We have an uh, outboard motor that goes on it but it really shines on the ice. So we'll show you how, to, how we enact a, rec a rescue with the RDC. They're gonna push it up to the hole where the victim is. They're gonna talk to the victim. They're gonna position it directly over her. And as he sits back, obviously she comes out of the water. The tap on the head is the pull sign to the haul team and they pull her off the ice. We provide a service that the Sheriff's Department really doesn't have enough people to do without a volunteer team. And I can't get that through enough that we are all volunteer um, and, you know, we can always use new members. So if you feel you're qualified and you have some knowledge of woods or ice, you know, come on out and try out. Um, it's a really quick application process, then you'll have a, uh, an interview, and then you have a probation period, and then you'll be added to the team. Tourism slows down in the UP in the winter, making it the prime time to visit some of our most popular attractions. You can soak in the splendor of these places with minimal people or even all to yourself. Kichta Kippi is one of the great natural wonders of the UP, and one I feel is even more magical in the winter. While almost every other body of water is blanketed with a thick sheet of ice, the 45 degree crystal clear turquoise water of the Big Spring is striking against the stark white sparkling snow. Kichta Kippi, the largest natural freshwater spring in Michigan, is located 12 miles north of Manistique on M149 inside of Palms Book State Park. This oval body of water is 300 feet by 175 feet and 45 feet deep, about as deep as the trees bordering the spring are tall. The spring is a short walk from the parking lot, a bit longer of a walk in the winter as the parking lot is unplowed. When I went, a narrow strip was plowed for vehicles to park just before the park entrance. A self-operated observation raft takes visitors to the middle of the spring. From along the sides and the cutout middle of the raft, you can view the entire underwater world all the way to the emerald bottom. Clouds of sand swirl around the gushing of more than 10,000 gallons of water a minute from fissures in the underlying limestone. Large lake trout, brown trout and brook trout can be seen swimming around the pool, almost like you're at an aquarium, but even better. The fish move freely between the spring and Indian Lake, which the spring feeds, while mallards swim above the ancient trees preserved under the water. Kishta Kippi is an Ojibwe word said to have many meanings, including the great water, the blue sky I see, the roaring bubbling spring, big cold water, and mirror of heaven. Whatever its name, Kishta Kippi has drawn curious sightseers for decades. This area was preserved as a state park in 1928 thanks to a local five and dime store owner in Manistique named John Belair, who enjoyed the beautiful quiet spring. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.
was for him to film, I think. <laughs> 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 Please put that on TV. <laughs> <laughs>